thanks, Gordon. And uh, thanks to the organisers for giving me the chance to talk to you. Um, it's certainly uh, been uh, a subject of much interest to the HREX in South Australia as they uh, start to deal with more and more artificial intelligence uh, applications. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about artificial intelligence and the sort of work that we're doing, uh, which I think is probably representative of the sort of work happening generally around Australia, and then talk a little bit about uh, what responsible AI in medical research would look like. So I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects. Uh, I'm working on the grounds of the, uh, the lands of the Kaurna people, uh, uh, who are the traditional custodians uh, of the ancestral lands that uh, I work on. Uh, and we acknowledge the, uh, the, the uh, leaders of the Kaurna people, past, present and emerging. So what's artificial intelligence? Um, uh, and here uh, we have to be specific that we're not talking about general artificial intelligence, which is something that might be as, uh, as sentient as a human. Um, that's very much science fiction and it's very unclear we're ever going to get there. So, uh, you know, that's sort of off the table. Uh, but what we're talking about is the sort of artificial intelligence that we apply uh, in, in medicine all the time. And uh, so there are lots and lots and lots, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of opinions about artificial intelligence. And it's a subject of great interest to the media and, and to social media. So um, artificial intelligence uh, has been around for quite a while, uh, but advances in computing technology and in algorithmic development have meant that suddenly we have access to computational power and tools that we simply didn't have access to in the past. And this has led to breakthroughs of superhuman performance in things as diverse as, uh, you know, the current world chess champion is a computer, and uh, that's based on machine learning. The current Go champion is a computer, and we have self-driving cars, sort of, uh, and, uh, and lots of other advances, including in medicine. Um, so, the potential of artificial intelligence is to automate onerous tasks and to potentially be able to outperform humans at specific tasks. AI is very, very stupid. Uh, it's been said many times. It's something I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, and one thing is that, you know, as humans, we tend to anthropomorphize things, uh, uh, I guess it's part of our nature. Um, but the way that human, uh, humans make decisions and computers make decisions are very, very different. So an algorithm has a completely different decision-making process than a human, and it would be a mistake to ever think that it's a same, similar or, or, or the same process. So uh, I'd like to give you a metaphor for artificial intelligence, which I think works really well. Consider the, the humble pigeon. Uh, so the humble pigeon um, could generously be described as having a brain the size of a pea. Uh, it is um, governed by reflex actions. It has lots of capacity to learn, but very limited capacity or no capacity to reason in the sense that a human can reason. However, you can train pigeons to read screening mammography uh, images and detect breast cancer, which is quite remarkable but it makes sense because the pigeon is very, very good at detecting spatial patterns. And that's how pigeons home. So you can, you know, if I, if I had a pigeon from some coop in Melbourne right now, I could release it and assuming it didn't get eaten along the way, it would make its way back to Melbourne, back to that specific house. And that's quite a remarkable feat for something that is very dumb. And so I think uh, there's a few things to unpack there. One, the, the uh, 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 pigeon is essentially very stupid, but can still do some remarkable things based on its ability to detect spatial patterns. Uh, and two, um, it's probably more likely to say the pigeons are going to rise up and take over our society than it is to say my algorithm is going to rise up and take over society. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's just another field of statistics. So it's just statistics. And if you know what a regression model is, uh, a, a machine learning model is essentially a complicated regression model. Uh, and the difference between that and conventional regression models is that you can have millions of features uh, uh, or covariates or explanatory variables. Uh, if you're talking about an image 
Or if you're talking about a large language model, you could have billions of features. And that's the difference between a conventional regression model and what we do in machine learning. But these things are in no sense smart. They're in no sense reasoning and uh, essentially are doing pretty reflex things. Although the results, as we all know from playing around with large language models like chat GPT, is, can be quite remarkable. So machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that involves algorithms and data that automatically analyze and make decisions without human intervention. So machines learn, and we can have a whole discussion about what learning is, but they learn in some sense when they change their structure, their program or their data in such a manner that their expected future performance improves. And machine learning generally refers to changes in systems that perform tasks that are associated with artificial intelligence. So this has some great advantages. It's fast, it can be fast, it can be accurate, it can be efficient. It can automate many applications and particularly onerous things like reading slides in pathology or reading x-rays for a radiologist looking for something very simple like a fracture. Um, it has a wide range of real life applications. So the business plan of almost every tech company in the world is based around artificial intelligence. Uh, we recently had a parliamentary inquiry in South Australia uh, about artificial intelligence, which I and a, a, a bunch of my colleagues got summons to. And what we told the committee was essentially there's not very few parts of human life that won't be touched by artificial intelligence. And it's been called what we're living through right now, uh, uh, the fifth industrial revolution. So um, it is having huge impact. Um, if you go and look at what is uh, uh, happening in private radiology at the moment, you would find that most private radiologists in Australia are using AI-based uh, computer-aided decision support systems. So this stuff's, it's not theoretical, it's out there, it's in clinical practice right now. Um, uh, and we can handle high and multi-dimensional data, which uh, is very useful, particularly when we start to think about things like images where you've got very high resolution images with potentially millions of pixels uh, and features within those images. The disadvantages of machine learning, uh, it, can, it can be difficult to identify and rectify errors. Explainability is an issue. These things are black boxes. Frankly, we don't really understand how deep learning works, just that it does and remarkably well. Um, data acquisition can be a problem. So uh, to be able to train a model, uh, a machine learning model, you need very well annotated data. And often the clinical data we routinely collect might not be annotated to the extent. And annotation is just a computer science word for phenotyping or uh, uh, um, uh, uh, saying that, that people have certain characteristics. Um, interpretation results can be tricky and often you require specialized equipment. Uh, so you need uh, large uh, GPUs and, um, and workstations and you need large amounts of data storage, particularly if we're talking about uh, medical images where we might need petabytes of storage uh, for large data sets. So some types of machine learning algorithms are neural networks, and that's the sort of work that, that mostly we do, uh, but random forest decision trees, genetic algorithms, uh, radial bias basis functions and sigmoid functions. Everything below neural networks is what we would call weak machine learning. And there isn't a lot of uh, difference uh, from an ethical point of view or from a scientific point of view for these weak forms of, of machine learning and your classic regression models. So logistic and linear regression, uh, I would classify as the same sort of uh, resolution as, as these weaker forms of machine learning. And just as we're very used to dealing with regression models, um, they don't tend to raise very specific uh, ethical issues. The reason we use neural networks is because this is a way of analysing uh, very complicated data with very large numbers of features like medical images. So uh, there are three types of machine learning. So supervised learning is where you have a training signal. So you say, here's a group of people who have disease and here's a group of people who don't have disease. And they, they, these are the X-rays or the CT scans or the MRIs associated with those two groups of people and try and try and tell those people apart based on the image features. 
So can we use uh, image features or uh, large amounts of EMR data to diagnose disease, to prognose outcomes within a diseased group of people or to predict response to therapy? And uh, uh, generally, because of the history of the field, what we're trying to do is classify data. And that means I've got a binary or a categorical outcome. And classically, this would be disease, no disease. Um, so we tend, it, the applications tend to be quite simple. Um, you will find some people doing regression-based approaches with quantitative outcomes, but that's very nascent in this area, largely because it came out of computer science where the main task was to classify things. Unsupervised learning um, just means we don't have a training signal, we don't have a labelled response, uh, and so it's, it's a way of trying to automatically identify structures within data, not something we're heavily using in medical AI. And then you have things like reinforcement learning where we penalise or reward the algorithm based on the decisions that it makes. So uh, in classic regression, uh, we learn a trend line between continuous variables, so good old y equals mx plus b. What we're doing in machine learning is something similar where we're classifying groups uh, uh, within a, a set of data and we're learning a decision boundary between discrete classes. So similar uh, and, in fact, anecdotally, um, if you have the choice between a binary logistic regression and a random forest, you tend to get pretty much the same results. There's not a lot of difference on the ground and you don't get generally, if you can use a logistic regression or a linear regression, you don't tend to get more bang for your buck out of these weaker forms of machine learning. So we do mostly work on uh, medical images. So I have two academic radiologists within my team in the Australian Institute for Machine Learning and all our work's based on medical images. And this is because uh, this is a fundamental discipline underlying uh, a lot of clinical medicine, just like pathology underlies a lot of clinical medicine. So there aren't many areas of medicine where images aren't an integral part of diagnosis and prognosis. So uh, image analysis is essentially a way of turning a picture into a matrix of numbers and then manipulating that matrix of numbers. So, um, and humans are remarkably good at seeing patterns. And so you can look at that and we can all kind of think, yeah, that could be Abraham Lincoln. Um, hard to say why we're saying that because there's not a lot of features there. It's pretty blocky but we can still do that because it's a characteristic set of features. Um, and so we might have things like pixel intensity and uh, shape and texture are fundamental low level features that we might want to turn into numbers. Uh, a filter or a kernel is used in image analysis and that's a feature matrix that we slide across the image to detect a pattern. And we might be detecting an edge, for example. And the dot product is calculated at each pixel. So when that pattern, which might be an edge, is present in the image, the output value is higher. So we can define low level features within an image. Other more complex patterns can be identified and mathematically defined. And for example, texture can be defined mathematically. So we're taking an image, we're turning it into a matrix of numbers, and then we're manipulating those numbers. Um, patterns like lines and textures are the basic visual uh, constituents of images. They're called low-level features, but we can build up to high-level features. So we start with the very basic building blocks of an image and build up to what's a cat, what's a dog, what's a different brand of car, um, and uh, that's the kind of high-level features that self-driving automobiles use. But uh, this can conventionally be very difficult but our solution to doing that in a computational sense is to use what's called deep learning. And here we're using conv convolutional neural networks generally. And these are networks that learn the features of an image. And this was designed to mimic the exact way that a human brain learns visual features. So we start with the, the raw images input and we build up from low level to high level features information about what is is contained in that image and it turns out that deep learning can do this better than humans in some contexts so we've had some remarkable successes in ophthalmology 
uh, in dermatology where the uh, image analysis for a simple task uh, using a deep learning algorithm outperforms the best human doctor, uh, which is terrific, uh, which means we can automate uh, uh, some of our processes and we can improve detection, uh, classification, and we can improve ultimately patient outcome. So there are two good conceptual ways of thinking about deep learning. One is uh, if you're mathematically inclined, you can think about it as linear algebra, where we're simply solving a complex matrix equation, or, and this is more intuitive for people with biological training, as a simple linear model with feature transformation. So you can regard this as a very complicated regression model, and that's all it is, which means it's not magic, it's not going to solve all of our problems, it has limitations, and it's certainly not going to take over the world, because just as my logistic regression model isn't going to suddenly rise up and take over the world, nor is my uh, deep learning model. So uh, you can think about deep learning uh, 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 neural networks uh, in two parts. So we put in some kind of input image. Uh, we then have a convolutional layer, an activation layer, a pooling layer. And this is basically recursively exploring the features in the image, building up from low level to high level features. And then we have some classifier. And very often that classifier is some kind of logistic regression classifier. And we're classifying the image as either a horse, a deer, or a dog, and we'll get some kind of classification probab probability out at the end of the model where it's most likely that that image is a horse, but not completely certain. And you can see the obvious applications to disease diagnosis and prognosis. Here's some of our work uh, where we took uh, all of the hip fractures from the emergency department at the Royal Adelaide Hospital over a 10 year period. Uh, and we basically trained a model to detect hip fracture. And uh, as an important part of the preclinical workup, we actually pulled in all our favours and we got a bunch of radiologists to read a test set so that we could directly compare the performance of our deep learning model to what human uh, clinicians could do. And we started off with non-radiologist doctors uh, like country GPs who are used to reading x-rays, then general radiologists, and then the most specialised uh, and theoretically the best people to read a hip x-ray, and that is a subspecialised musculoskeletal radiologist. And you can see that uh, you get a nice dose response uh, effect with years of clinical training and specialised training, which is great because that's what you'd hope to find if our clinical training system works well. Uh, but you will also notice that uh, the best human did not perform as well as our algorithm. And so uh, hip fracture is a catastrophic event for most people, uh, tends to afflict the elderly. Mortality rates at 12 months are very high, 60 to 70%. And uh, very often it, it's a huge life altering event. The biggest predictor of prognosis in hip fracture is how quickly we can get someone into surgery. So all hip fractures are surgically repaired and how quickly we get people into fracture into surgery determines outcome to a large extent. Around 10% of hip fractures are, are, are not picked up on initial screening and that delays uh, 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 progress to surgery. So using an algorithm like this would have obvious clinical and uh, 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 um, patient outcome uh, uh, benefits and, and economic benefits. Um, and our, where, where we would go next with this would be a diagnostic clinical trial. So uh, turning to responsible AI in clinical translation, we have some principles that we subscribe to, which aren't too different from the normal principles we think about as HREX. So inclusiveness, fairness, transparency, reliability and safety, privacy and security, and accountability, and this overlap between what is ethical and what is uh, explicable. So if we want to take a responsible uh, 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 route to uh, uh, AI in clinical medicine or clinical situations, then this was what the roadmap would look like. We'd be thinking about robust scientific evidence, real-world clinical evaluation, and post-deployment monitoring We'd also have to think about regulation of AI as a medical device. And as usual, 
uh, the, the legal framework and the regulatory framework around artificial intelligence is lagging behind the, uh, uh, the actual technology. Having said that, there are thousands of algorithms that have been approved by the FDA for use in clinical situations. However, not a single one of those, and this is a really important point, is an autonomous decision-making device. For the same reason that self-driving cars have proved problematic, nobody's willing to trust a, a AI algorithm to be autonomous in a high-risk clinical situation, and we might never get there. So everything that's been approved and is in practice right now are computer-aided decision support machines. They're not actually making autonomous decisions about human patients. So uh, not surprisingly, the way to uh, do ethical AI in medicine is to have robust scientific evidence, in other words, to do good science. And that's no different than any other uh, thing that we might consider as a hate trick. So it might not surprise you to learn that um, most studies out there uh, in a medical AI have not been validated. And again, you know, the language used around machine learning is a little different because the field arose out of computer science. So when computer scientists say validate, they mean replicate. So to show in an independent study population. So most studies are not even internally replicated and the vast majority have not been externally validated. So it's like the early days of gene discovery where, uh, you know, we'd, we'd publish a paper reporting something in our population, but lo and behold, it would turn out that other people couldn't replicate it. How did we overcome that in complex disease genetics? We basically uh, came up as a community with some strict uh, rules around what constitutes replication in genetic association studies, and then we had the journals take up those, those guidelines, those recommendations. And now if you look at a lot of my papers, a lot of papers of people in the field, you will find two or 300 authors and everybody works in large international consortia with dozens or scores of individual studies being meta-analyzed. We haven't got there in artificial intelligence yet, but that's definitely where we need to go. Uh, so most studies are not replicated and that's a problem. So we don't know uh, uh, what level of trust to put in those results that are being published. Um, it's very nascent as a field, and but it's but it's evolving rapidly. The other thing we haven't done a lot of is randomised control trials. So there's literally a handful, you can almost count them on two hands, of randomised control trials for algorithms that claim to diagnose or prognose disease. So it's all happened at a sort of theoretical in silico uh, uh, level but very little of it has, has uh, gone through clinical workup so that we could say when, you know, in the real world, when we put this thing into practice, here's what happens. Um, and these are the cost savings. These are the economic benefits. And this is what happens to patient outcomes. So we lack an evidence base of what happens when we put these things into clinical practice in the main. So again, that's something uh, that has to change. And of course, we're all well aware that there is a, a chronic problem with reproducibility in science in general, in medical research in particular, and in some fields in particular. And we did have this problem in genetics before we fixed it, uh, but we haven't quite fixed it in artificial intelligence yet. Although, as I said, this, this space is evolving very rapidly. Um, fortunately, uh, there are a lot of guidelines that have been published. We've been active in publishing some of these guidelines. So uh, there are good guidelines. There, you, many of you may be familiar with the tripod and starred guidelines, and there are now uh, specific uh, uh, implementations of tripod and starred study design uh, uh, and um, evaluation guidelines specifically for artificial intelligence uh, applications. Uh, similarly, there are published guidelines for um, safety and utility on a small scale where people are doing early real life clinical evaluations of AI algorithms. And there are uh, guidelines for prospective clinical trials. So how do you do a good clinical trial? Already the better journals like Radiology and Radiology AI have implemented these guidelines as checklists that you have to go and check as an author before you can submit your paper. So 
we're coming rapidly out of a Wild West situation and into a much more regulated, uh, defined space. The, sh the, the takeaway from this, though, is that there are uh, a very clear, uh, well thought through international guidelines which can guide an ethics committee as to assessing uh, whether this is good science and whether it's ethical science. So real world clinical evaluation is really important. Uh, so prospective observational studies uh, are critical before you would think about putting something into clinical practice. Multi-center studies are important. Local validation, uh, so silent trials where you implement an algorithm but blind the clinicians to the results of that algorithm so that you could, in a sense, do the counterfactual thing of, let's imagine we did implement this thing clinically, what would the outcomes be? Uh, those are all important as are actual experimental interventional studies and uh, thinking about human factors. So we have, um, uh, my team is half clinically trained and half engineers, but we also have uh, people from psychology looking at human factors. So how do radiologists interact with AI technology and computer-aided uh, decision support systems? And that's a really important part of it. So if the algorithm's right, does that make the radiologist more accurate? If it's wrong, what happens? Th those kind of studies are, are, are also in an early stage, but rapidly happening. Um, so thinking about doing preclinical and clinical workups before you rush into, let's put this into the clinic, uh, are really important. But this is no different, really, than the sort of evidence we would require before, before implementing any new uh, therapy or test into a clinical setting. We'd require an evidence base that, yes, this thing actually was beneficial in the real world. So clinical research, again, a takeaway, clinical research underlies the ethical integration of healthcare artificial intelligence. So exploratory analyses are important, silent trials are important, and prospective evaluation are all important. And you'd want to see all of those things being done before you said, yes, let's go, let's put this into clinical practice. Uh, again, there are lots of uh, excellent publications um, coming partly sometimes from our group, but also uh, from other groups around uh, what would a research ethics framework look like. And I would uh, encourage you to start to look at uh, these um, publications. They're not very different in, um, in, in basic concept to the way we evaluate any kind of science. So, and uh, uh, we, we develop our models in silico in very controlled environments, and that's terrific. And that's, that's how we train medical students as well. But as anyone who's been in a real ED knows, the real life is not quite so simple. Um, we will have fail states that did not arise when we trained our model. Um, the model in a machine learning context can only know what you trained it on. So Google famously got into enormous amounts of trouble uh, about eight years ago when one of its facial recognition algorithms uh, identified African-Americans as monkeys because the algorithm had never seen an African-American person. It was only trained on white people. So that's an important uh, source of potential bias. The model can only know what you've trained it on, and so therefore training models on representative samples of data is very important. Um, but even with you know best good faith intentions, there will always be situations that you haven't trained the model for where the model might fail. So technical validation, very important, but clinical evaluation is equally important when we're thinking about medical AI. So, uh, and important points, good technical performance. So I might have a fantastically well-performing model that, you know, explains 99% of the area under the receiver operating curve, which is how, tends to be how we measure classification performance in these models. Uh, but that might not always translate into clinical, into patient benefit. So uh, good examples from advanced screening for certain cancers. All that we succeeded in doing was increasing health uh, healthcare spending. We increased patient anxiety, had little benefit to patient outcome. Uh, diagnostic downshift is another uh, issue. The potential to increase clinical workload without added value to patient care is something we need to be wary of. 
uh, and presumptions of low risk uh, uh, may be ethically vulnerable. So, uh, and uh, just to take one area, um, again, because this field arose out of computer science, um, nobody was interested in confounding, nobody had ever heard of confounding. Uh, what we teach first year epidemiology and clinical students is you've always got to be thinking about sex, you've always got to be thinking about age, and you've always got to be thinking about ethnic or cultural background, because disease prevalence, disease uh, natural history, uh, risk factors are all usually highly correlated with those potential confounders. So you're always thinking about these things as a clinician and we're always thinking about these things as a scientist. Not surprisingly, not something you think about if you're a computer scientist. So I guess what's happened over the last couple of years is computer science discovers confounding. And yes, indeed, we already know that uh, racial bias in our medical systems, in our public health systems, uh, in, in electronic medical records is a prevalent and uh, a real thing. And certainly that's true in Australia as it is in most other uh, developed countries. Many, many examples of this, both at a clinical and genetic level. So uh, we were involved in some work last year that got published in um, uh, Lancet Digital Health where, um, and this is very interesting. So. If you show any radiologist in the world a chest X-ray and say, right, what's the ethnic background of this person? No human can do that. It's not something we do clinically, but it's not something we can do. It turns out that you can train a, a machine learning model, a deep learning model, to detect self-identified racial identity remarkably well, almost 100% accurate you know, AUCs of 0 0.99, 0 0.98. And, okay, that's thorax, but it's also true of brain. It's also true of hand, of feet, or pretty much any area of the body. Even when we start to mask that image and blur it to the point where a human with a human eyeball can't tell that it's an image, we can still see that signal. So it's a very strong signal. Um, we couldn't believe the results, frankly, ourselves. So we went and found lots and lots of replication cohorts and replicated across many, many different cohorts. And this seems to be a very robust signal. What we're working on now is to try and explain what is it in the image that, that is being identified, that is correlated so strongly with racial identity. The main takeaway, though, here is if we don't uh, in some way mitigate that confounding effect of, of uh, uh, self-identified racial identity, we could very easily have a model that is calibrated perfectly well for the majority of the population who might be white, but performs very poorly on subpopulations like the African-American population where it might, and we have real examples of this, systematically underdiagnose disease. So worse than doing no harm, you'd actually perpetuate ethnic and racial biases uh, in clinical medicine. So, um, so all of this is a long-winded way of saying, um, just like the rest of epidemiology and clinical medicine and clinical research, we need to be mindful of our training data and we need to be mindful of potential biases arising from confounding. Then post-deployment marketing is very important because, of course, um, you may very well have data set shift. And we've, we've seen this effect in uh, uh, genomics as well. So uh, I moved to Australia, back to Australia from Toronto about 10 years ago. Uh, Toronto is one of the world's most ethnically diverse cities on a number of indices. And uh, with each new wave of immigrants into um, uh, 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 Toronto, particularly from sub-Saharan Africa, the genotyping panels we would use on children diagnostically, so genetic panels used diagnostically on children, would have to be updated every year. And that's called data set drift, where your population, the structure of your population changes over time, and the model that you had as a predictive model becomes unfit for purpose. In other words, you have to keep retraining your model over time. You can't just train it once and hope for the best that it will be perfectly performing uh, forever afterwards. And so that's also a factor in uh, medical artificial intelligence. So um, how do clinicians make good decisions using AI tools? It's all contextual. It depends on the task. 
Uh, it depends on the decision space, you know, so what is a good decision for my patient? What does the model know? Uh, how good is the model's ability to reflect the context uh, of the, my patient or, or the problem is framed in? So the medical knowledge system, the contextual knowledge, uh, and how does it integrate knowledge within the context? So it's not a magic bullet. There will be things that uh, deep learning and machine learning won't be able to resolve. Um, we're not going to lose our need to have trained, well-trained doctors anytime soon. Um, Jeffrey Hinton, about five years ago, predicted that we'd have stopped training radiologists by now, but surprise, surprise, that hasn't happened. And in fact, we're training more radiologists than we, than we ever have before. So uh, I'd like to finish there. Um, I hope that's been informative to you. Um, I guess the important thing to know is there are, are a whole bunch of really good tools that have been published out there, and I would encourage you to, uh, to access those. This is our responsible AI team. Um, Melissa McCradden's a clinical bioethicist uh, uh, from SickKids who we've recruited to Adelaide from Toronto. Uh, and so she'll be here in January. And we've got two postdocs and another senior lecturer all working uh, on responsible AI and very happy to answer queries by email or help out however we can. And one of our first jobs based on demand uh, when Melissa gets here, we'll be writing some uh, Australian guidelines for HRECs and um, uh, specifically how to assess um, AI projects. So thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thanks, Lyle. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's fascinating talk, and it just shows, as you say, how far technology has come. Um, so just, uh, I mean, in terms of its limitations, it's applicable to radiology uh, to the extent of 99.5%. Um, what other fields will it be of health and medicine? Do you think this will be usefully applicable to? Well, uh, so... Yes, it's radiology, but we do projects in ophthalmology and uh, rheumatology and cardiology and oncology mm. uh, and, uh, and respiratory medicine and a whole bunch of things because radiology is, is an integral part of diagnosis and prognosis in each of those fields. So, yes, we're focused on images, um, but it's not radiology per se. It's it's the application to specific diseases. Um, so... Uh, we work across a very broad range of things. Um, but in addition to that, um, it's, you know, pathology is an area that cries out for automation. A lot of pathology has been automated uh, and we're rapidly moving towards a situation where we have automated reading of um, uh, tissue uh, slices and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, so I would expect, we've already seen big changes in radiology I would expect to seek ongoing changes in pathology, but also in a whole bunch of other diseases. So there are clinical algorithms in use in ophthalmology right now, for example, in dermatology. This is all going to grow. Um, and and uh, a lot of those tasks, frankly, free clinicians up to do other things, you know, like they're very mm -hmm. routine reading tasks. And so they cry out for automation. But there will be other things where that you wouldn't automate. Um, that would be difficult to automate. Um, so it's going to be a mixed bag, I think, as we go forward. And uh, there's some really good comments in the chat. And one of them was in relation to rural and remote um, healthcare and, uh, yeah. um, you know, being able to pick up things that may take a lot longer for specialists to diagnose. And as you yes. pointed out, the uh, yeah. response to things like hip fractures is dependent upon picking them up as soon as possible. Yeah. So that sounds like a great advantage. And, sort of closes the gap in healthcare to some extent in yeah. areas. Yeah, so it's a, I think it's a logical extension of telemedicine. And uh, yeah. actually our hip fracture work, we've just replicated in another Australian data set. Um, and uh, a Dutch group has taken our work one step further and they've built an algorithm that works on a smartphone picture of an X-ray. Uh, so, you know, one step removed and showing um, the mm -hmm. same sort of superhuman performance that we showed. So if you're in a rural setting or you're in a setting, you know, in, in a country where there aren't radiologists, you know, waiting around to read your X-ray, um, this would have obvious application. And I think so that it opens up a whole new world, uh, I think, for telemedicine where people can take 
pictures of their own eyes. They can take pictures, you know, that, um, hard to take your own X-ray, but <laughs> but but if you can get an X-ray, then um, then you can get an algorithm to read it. And um, moving on to the, the, so we're going to read one from Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Uh, McBurter Theron Tazzy. Uh, let's get the cursor back. We can see that given the need for huge data sets from large consortia to validate AI models, do you think that we will hit practical problems in achieving appropriate diversity in training data sets? Yes, definitely. Um, so it, it, it's high quality labeled data. Let me give you a real example. So um, rheumatoid arthritis is not, is not uncommon, uh, but um, uh, there's a thing called the hack score, which is a very good uh, uh, scoring algorithm to, um, to uh, that, that is highly predictive of future outcome. The trouble is it takes a, an experienced rheumatologist a few hours to, to label someone's uh, I images of the hand and feet. And so it's so expensive and so time consuming that we can only use uh, that inside clinical trials because otherwise we can't afford to do that in routine clinical care. So one of the things we're doing as part of our project is to train a, an AI algorithm to hack score someone. Um, but the other point about that is, um, you know, so we, we've got a very well-labeled data set of, let's say, 400 people, but when we look around for replication samples with similar labels, it's very hard to find replication samples. So there's a, you know, ideally, rule of thumb, you'd want at least 1,000 people, but uh, um, uh, sometimes, based on the disease, it's hard to get that. Now, now, if we're talking about COPD or something like that, we can get tens of thousands of cases. But for some diseases and particularly rare conditions, Again, we're going to be in the gen genomics uh, space of having to work as part of large multinational uh, cohorts. And that raises an issue uh, around data sharing. Uh, so, you know, we, we tend not to share data. We share statistical results and people do meta-analyses on them. That might not always be appropriate for machine learning projects. So we might, uh, uh, it, it's more likely that we're going to have to share raw data. And so that raises issues for HREX. There's a, uh, a glorious and strong tradition in computer science of making data sets publicly on, online and open to everyone. And they love having competitions where everyone in the world brings their favourite flavour of algorithm and has a go at it. Uh, um, but that obviously, again, raises serious issues for a HREC asked to approve uh, that kind of use of data. Obviously, it would be yeah. de-identified, but you know, that raises issues around consent and lots of other things. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll carry on to Rebecca's question, but just a point, I mean, you know, the Privacy Act allows one to use data without consent for certain purposes, say for community yeah. benefit, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see situations where uh, one one could be sharing data for the, yes. for for community benefit. Uh, but it brings us on to the, the issue of, of, of diversity in, in data sets, yeah. and sharing data with respect to those that may not wish it shared. And some of the chat was uh, is, is really, really in insightful in terms of uh, recognition of um, ethnic groups. So Rebecca's point is, I'm thinking particularly in terms of diversity, I'm thinking particularly about Indigenous participant groups who are reluctant to consent to sharing of their information. How do you see the protection inclusion dilemma playing out in this context? So the way, uh, well, I can just tell you what's happening in South Australia. So um, we treat medical images as we do all other sources of linked administrative data. So we go through one central H HREC called the Department of Health and Welfare, uh, Wellbeing HREC, which I sit on. And uh, so all data linkage projects go through one HREC and um, a waiver of consent is sought to, uh, to utilise that information and to answer your question more directly, there is no mechanism for opt out, uh, as far as I know, in any Australian jurisdiction. So uh, we we apply us for a simple waiver of consent. The, the medical images are no different than um, any other part of the routinely collected clinical data in, in that framework. Mm. And Niall, I mean, uh, I think we, we heard a talk earlier today, just uh, uh, um, uh, Philomena essentially saying that you know, women were excluded from from a particular 
late HIV study, even though they're, you know, because they're pregnant or, or, or whatever. But but clearly there are some situations where, you know, you have to have that diversity because all the images may, there may be some, and uh, not COPD necessarily, but you know, there yeah. may be some conditions where where the radiology is different in, in different uh, genders or races. I mean, I'm not yeah. certain if that's the case, but it's possible. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, look, getting diverse, like, like our, our chronic, uh, our rheumatoid arthritis data set is overwhelmingly European and there's no obvious way to, for us to, to increase the size of the training data set. Yeah. So sometimes you are simply limited. So yeah. that, but that means you would be very, very cautious about applying that algorithm to anyone who wasn't European ancestry. Um, to, and to answer Patrick Fulm's point, um, I'm a geneticist. I hate the word race. It, it, it has no scientific meaning uh, uh, in a genetic sense. Um, this was a US-based uh, study and uh, it relied on self-identified racial identity. So people in the US self-identify as Hispanic or self-identify as African-American, et cetera, and that's where that comes from. So it's not a biological designator. It's what people call themselves. Um, and it was a, there was an interesting question about would the um, would, in terms of its ability to distinguish racial identities, could it, for example, distinguish between different Aboriginal uh, races or, or you know, um... don't know, don't know. We yeah. don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, and and there's an important ethical point here about incorporating uh, Indigenous data. Um, because at the moment, all of our data sets that we have access to publicly are overwhelmingly European. Um, so uh, that that is something we we haven't dealt with yet as a as a as a scientific community. And Jan asked a question: Are we heading back to a type of eugenics? Jan, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, as, as no. Lyle's pointing out, this is really about having a data set that is as diverse and. Uh, uh, yeah. and, as, and complete as one can make it, given the limitations and applying yeah. that 99% you know, um, uh, predictability to to what you do is is clearly beneficial to the to the population. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just making sure that the the diagnostic or prognostic algorithm that you're trying to uh, to invent and and hope you know we all invent these things because we want them to be used clinically. Uh, it is representative of the population you would apply it to and therefore calibrated for that population so that it gives it doesn't give misleading answers for subsets of the population. Um, and what is the level of training of clinicians in, in, in these things? I mean, do they have to understand the, the benefits and limitations of this uh, as, as much as anyone, as much as participants? Um I think so, and I, I think particularly if 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 you're down at the pointy end of clinical implementation, then definitely. Um, but you know, it's it, again, it's it, people doing machine learning like to code it in a, in a thick layer of of uh, opacity and and mystique. It's just statistics. It's just another field of statistics, and all of our uh, uh, clinicians who are doing PhDs with us uh, become very au fait with working in Python and fitting deep learning models and interpreting them. And some of them actually go and do methodological work and go to computer science conferences and present. So it's approachable. Um, the tools have become more and more polished so that, you know, if you can pick up starter and fit a regression model, you can, you can fit a deep learning model. You know, there are some complexities about dealing with uh, uh, images as input, where you probably need some expert advice. But once you've turned your images into a matrix of numbers, um, it's literally like like using Starter or R or any other statistical package. So it's approachable, is I guess is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. And uh, Su Susan Smith is reminding us it's not just about training in AI, but also about epidemiology and biostats. Yes, that really, really assists. Thank you, Susan. Very. Yeah. No. 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 That's and that is strongly yeah. our view that that. Um, you know, you can't ignore the last few thousand years of clinical medicine or the last few hundred years of epidemiology when you do this work. And so people have to have a strong grounding in, in those areas, just as they do for any other area of medical research. Uh, good question from John Edwards. With a level of hunger for access to large data sets, should Atrex be vigilant about the possibility that applications may be more about accessing data sets than delivering concrete benefits? 
Absolutely. Yes. Right. Yes is the answer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think we should always be asking why people are, are wanting to access data sets and what the research question is. And they're not just uh, yeah. seeking data sets for the sake of mining. I, other, other I think another thing that's very different about this AI revolution that, you know, so most of the genomics revolution happened inside academia. A bit of it happened in private industry, but most of it happened in academia. So the Human Genome Project was an academic project, mm. but that is not true of the AI revolution. A lot of this work's happening inside private industry. So Google and Amazon and Apple all have large health groups. And so the potential that a HREC's going to have to deal with commercial entanglements and, uh, uh, you know, the IP issues and who owns what and all of those kind of things is much stronger when it's an, an AI application than than in lots of other areas, I think. Um, no, thank you for that, Lyle. And one final question, possibly, uh, use of AI in counselling. Yes, so um, that's very interesting. So uh, uh, we've, we've just um, been discussing that on the Clinical Genomics Network for South Australia, which one of the networks I sit on. And um, it's actually been used extensively in genetic counselling and uh, as, a, as a, a form of expert system. And um, as I'm sure you all know, one of the issues is we don't, uh, I'm a geneticist by training, we don't have enough geneticists, in, enough clinical geneticists in Australia. And um, we're doing, but, but yet we're doing more and more genotyping to the point where 10% of our birth cohort every year in South Australia is, is, has whole genome sequencing. So we're using this extensively as a diagnostic tool, but we don't have enough people trained to be counsellors. So, um, so people have uh, trained AI systems to basically uh, take patients and their families through discussions about risk and, uh, and, and reproduction and, and, and all of the other issues that you might imagine would arise from uh, genotyping. So, so I think that's a really uh, uh, good example of um, a, an area of direct clinical impact that, that is only likely to increase. Now, Jan wishes to ask a question. Jan, feel free. Um, I'm interested in, um, I don't know how to turn on my face, but I'm out. Okay, no worries. Um, sorry. First of all, I think for remote um, communities, it's an extraordinary opportunity for that for those communities to get a much higher level of help. Um, I'm interested in terms of um, ethics applications. You actually came across a secondary finding. So you got your AI, you got what you wanted from your x-rays, which to me sounds quite a simple uh, ethics thing. Great. You're only dealing with images. Um, but I was concerned that I didn't understand possibly that you're saying you can look at physiology and determine race. That seems like an offshoot. Um, and yeah. so outside the ethics approval but of course important information but also I'm the one that raised uh, eugenics yeah um so uh uh it, it was a simple scientific question and um uh other people have done similar work with sex so you can show that um uh, you can have algorithms machine learning algorithms that are miscalibrated uh, that have been developed mostly in men that are miscalibrated in women and systematically underdiagnosed disease, et cetera. Uh, you can show the same thing for age. And we were just showing it uh, for self-identified racial identity. Uh, the question in our minds was, um, is this form of confounding likely to be important for image-based analysis? And so, so does the person say, I'm Aboriginal, you look at the screen and say, yes, they're Aboriginal, or can you have no race identification and look at the picture and say this person's Aboriginal? Uh, yes, you can do that, in fact. Uh, that's so what extraordinary. You... That's what... actually um, extremely needs a lot of dialogue. It certainly does, yes. Um, and we, we, no one was more surprised at the strength of the finding than us. Um, what was the strength? Oh, I mean, almost 100% accurate. Like That's was... just so um, um, I find that um, in terms of social science, social policy, medicine, earth-shattering. Yeah, yeah. So the only uh, thing I would say is that almost the entirety of the team, except for me... <laughs> was um was African American or Asian American. Um, so it was a group of people who 
uh, actually have a strong social science background uh, uh, who, who wanted to address this. So I guess you may not find that reassuring, but it, it, what I'm no, saying, no. it wasn't a bunch of white middle-aged men, which is what I am, uh, uh, deciding to just go off and do this. No, no, I'm believing the science, but yeah. I'm wondering yeah. um, if a bone, a vision of a bone, say a hip, yeah. can tell you a race, yeah. then we don't need DNA anymore for certain questions. Correct. Um, and, and actually it performs better than, you know, CSI does uh, <laughs> working with skeletal remains. So uh, it's actually a forensic tool as well. And it's not coming up with sim simple black and white. It's coming up with um, European with a dash of Chinese and a hint of, you know, Asian. No, no, it's, it's not like genetics in that sense. It, 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 so it will simply classify it's most, this person is most Majority. likely. Majority, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's just extraordinary. I hope it is. Not. It is, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you John. Uh, thank you, John, for your question. Um, so, Lyle, I think we are at the end of our, our little journey here. Yep. deep space um and really appreciate that it, it's um as many have said it, it sort of demystifies ai a bit i think it shows great hope for for medicine in in many respects and um you know like all things uh with, with great power comes great responsibility and uh yeah. how ethics committees can affect this uh it, it, we look forward to these guidelines because i think we all yes. want to know what our uh what our responsibilities are. And as I think I may have said yesterday, you know, we need AI management plans, we need data management plans, uh, and there, there are gender diversity guidelines. So clearly this, yeah. you know, this, this this conference brings together all of this thinking, but I think the AI to many of us who experience it right now is something imminent and, uh, you know, we really need to get on top of it. So thank you so much for that, Lyle. Really appreciate you taking the time. Pleasure. Talk, uh, and I'm okay. sure everyone else enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.